Okay, this is going to be uh, chapter 6, a skeletal system, and this is going to be part 1. Uh, introduction to the skeletal system. Um, pretty much the skeletal system supports the body. It works with the muscles to maintain the position and produce controlled, precise movements. Uh, and it has five primary functions, which will be important to remember. It provides support, uh, structural support for the entire body. It provides storage, and pretty much the storage for calcium. Um, it actually produces our red blood cells, white blood cells, and things like that from the bone marrow. And it protects. And the areas that it protects are the sensitive areas. Uh, example of this is going to be the brain, heart, lungs, the spinal column, and the pelvis uh, area. So the, the pelvic girdle, spinal column, and the vertebra, and the ribs, and then the skull. Uh, structure of the bone. The bone or osseous tissue, uh, supportive connective tissue that contains specialized cells and a matrix that consists of extracellular protein fibers and a ground substance. And this is just describing the actual bone or the osseous tissue itself. And then we have macroscopic features, which means that these are features that you can see. Four general shapes, uh, long, short, flat, and irregular. Long bones pretty much are longer than they are wide. An example of this are going to be the femur and the humerus. Uh, short bones, short bones <clears throat> dimensions are roughly equal. Uh, carpal bones and tarsal bones. Uh, flat bones, thin, relatively broad. Parietal skull and shoulder blades are example of this. Uh, irregular bones, complex shapes that do not fit into another category. An example, this is going to be the vertebra. So here's a picture of those. The long bones and the one that they used was the humerus. But this is longer then it is wide and then we have the parietal bone this is in the skull which is a flat bone and we have an irregular bone this doesn't really fit into any category it's because it's got holes in it and the holes would contain and actually house and encompass the spinal column and then we'd have holes here for various nerve tissues that would go in and out and then short bones these are the ones that are about as wide as they are long uh, these are going to be in the hands and feet uh, macroscopic features continued here. We have the diaphesis, the epiphysis, the epiphysis, as, as you can also pronounce it, compact bone, spongy bone, periosteum, and endoosteum. Uh, the diaphesis is pretty much the shaft of the bone, or, or the actual main part of it. The epiphysis is the expanding portions of the bone at the distal ends covered by articular cartilage. And whenever we take a look at this, Children have something called an epiphyseal plate, so they grow from the epiphyseal plate, and that's what this epiphysis is. Whenever you get older, it actually forms a suture line uh, and then becomes solid uh, after some remodeling occurs. Uh, compact bone is very dense. Spongy bone resembles bony rods or struts uh, separated by spaces, and these are just terms. Periosteum, outer surface of the bone covering, and you have the endo endoosteum, which uh, lines the marrow cavity and other inner surfaces, active during bone growth and repair or remodeling is occurring, and remodeling means that the bone is repairing itself after a fracture or break. So here are the areas. We have the proximal epiphysis, and this would be essentially the head. The epiphyseal line. Actually, I'll go ahead and... This right here is the epiphyseal line, and this is pointing to this area here. Um, we have in the diaphesis, we have essentially the marrow cavity and the main main shaft or the main structure of the bone here. This whole area, marrow cavity is in there. Endoosteum, which would be in the internal. We have the compact bone, which actually makes up the circular area here where all the red the bone marrow is located. You have the periosteum which is the covering, and then down here is our distal epiphysis. And if we had an epiphyseal line in this, it would be about right there, give or take. Uh, microscopic features. We have osteocytes, which are pretty much bone cells. Lacunae. A lacunae is a small piece, a small space, my apologies, containing an osteocyte in bone or a chondrocyte in cartilage. Now, remember that the chondrocytes or the cartilages are types of bone that just that are, that are more specialized. So they provide the padding. Um, they provide, provide so that there's no stress in between bones. 
So lacuna is in both of them. Uh, a lamella, <clears throat> narrow sheets of calcified matrix. Uh, canaliculi, small channels in the bone that radiate through the matrix. And this is going to be inside the bone. There's going to be multiple channels in there so that the bone communicate, can, can make things, can actually uh, provide blood supply to it. And then there's an osteon, which is a basic functional unit of compact bone. And these are the structures here. We have spongy bone, which is in this area here. We have bone marrow cavity, which is in the inside. And then we have the compact bone that is on the outside. All right. In that, in the compact bone, because here, they, here it is right here. Not the outer surface because it's periosteum. We have osteons, which that's what these are. And then let's kind of blow up an osteon. The osteon here, we exposed one and is protruding. This right here is the lamella. And this has a capillary vein. Nice, easy way to run. Uh, vessels through the interior of this. Uh, central canal here. Uh, perforating canal which means that it's going to go deeper. Endoosteum which would be the interior. Periosteum which would be the outer, outer exterior. And this is the arteries and veins that actually protrude in through the actual bone tissue itself. So Let's see here, one more thing. Okay, that's about it for the slide. Um, so please be aware of those. Osteon, central units. We have lamellas, which are functional units. And I'll clean some of this off. Oop. Clean some of this off so you can take a look at it overall again. So we have the osteons. We have the lamella spongy marrow cavity and compact bone this in the spongy looking stuff inside of here is the endoosteum we have canals that run through the actual bone tissue itself and the lamella that allow for collateral circulation canaliculi you can see here but there's some better pictures later on central canals which would be these The lamella that are running on the outside, which would be these here. And that pretty much covers it. And then this appears cellular layer of the periosteum and the fibrous layer of the periosteum. This is this right here is a fibrous connective tissue that's on the outside of the bones. Periosteum. Okay. Clinical note here, and we're talking about the interosseous needle placement. Uh, the interosseous needle is placed into a section that is pretty vascular, and what the interosseous needle does is it allows us to maintain and 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 um, tap essentially the central circulation. So this needle, whenever we are pushing fluid through it, might as well be a central line. This thing works faster. Uh, than most central lines do. We, we actually pressurize it in the newer versions of this. Uh, and this is kind of an older picture and an older look at it, but um, interosseous infusion is, is quite rapidly becoming the easiest way to initiate IV access on patients. Uh, this is the older type of IO needle. You had a, an adjustable plastic disc here, which you could essentially set the depth on your trocar or your needle here and then in a twisting fashion you would actually put it into the appropriate location well the appropriate location is on the medial side of the tibial tuberosity about two fingers down from where the knee joint is well sometimes you get a little over anxious whenever you was putting this thing in and put it right through the bone so this one wasn't so the well, this one was not the best method of this this is the big I.O., uh, the bone injection gun, and this thing here, in my opinion, does not work as well as, say, the easy I.O. The easy I.O. is no muss, no fuss, 
it's like Black and S Black and Decker. Uh, you essentially uh, find the find the appropriate landmarks um, to come two fingers down in the appropriate spot, and then center up the bone. Insert the needle until it you can feel it touch the bone. Pull the trigger, and it kind of does its own thing. It'll put it right in the uh, the, the interosseous area where you need it. <clears throat> This is the pediatric version of the big I.O. device. Uh, this is the fast one, sternal I.O. A lot of needles come out of this thing. If everyone will kind of take a look at that. Um, those are several very large needles that go into the sternum. Um, this thing has, at that point, a catheter device that will actually um, put the fluid into the appropriate space. It also has a removal device, which I don't like so much. This thing is kind of anchored in there. Uh, you can't just discard it by pulling straight out on it. Where the easy I.O., whenever they're done with it or they've got a central line in or want to discontinue the I.O., all they need to remove it is a 10 cc syringe in a twisting fashion, kind of pull it right out of the bone. So no must no fuss. Uh, this one here is anchored in there. Uh, it has to have the removal device to actually remove it. Uh, and this is the one, one of my favorites, which is the Easy I.O. Uh, nice and easy, no must no fuss. The needles are actually sized. You have the ones for the uh, big boned individuals. Or they have a lot of tissue in between the actual bone and the site that you're putting it in on. Um, yellow color code and then you have the adult which is blue color code and then you have the pink which is pediatric so most of these are appropriate size you just have to remember the color codes a little twist of the drill and it goes right in no twisting just just squeezing of the, the trigger and the, and the IO goes right in uh, 1.12 cells in the bone so we have osteocytes which are mature bone cells we have osteoclast giant cells with 50 or more nuclei big 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 cells and we have osteoblasts and cells responsible for the production of new bone so osteoblasts production of new bone osteocytes mature bone cells and then osteoclasts big giant cells with a bunch of nuclei in them bone formation and growth uh, determines the size and proportion of your body cartilage and other tissue are replaced by bone ossification and this is a replacement of other tissue by, by bone. Uh, calcification, the deposits of calcium salts occur during ossification, but it can also occur in the tissue other than bone. So we can get this in other areas like cartilages and things like that. And that kind of gives us problems as we go along. Intermembranous ossification. Uh, intermembranous ossification begins when osteoblasts differentiate within an embryotic or fetal fibrous connective tissue. The osteoblasts differentiate from the connective tissue, stem cells, and become calcified. And what this means is, is that kids are bendable at first. They're mostly cartilage, and as time goes on, they are introduced to more hormones in the fetal environment, and whenever they are born, um, this actually turns their bones into a more calcified or ossified version which means they they become more rigid and ossification center a place where ossification first takes place and if we'll take a look at this picture we have intermembranous bones that are up here these are well, this area is here we'll take a look at that yeah, almost see-through same way with the skin that's not bone yet half of these in here are not bone yet big large spaces not, that are not bone yet. Um, so it looks like that the actual bones are just in parts and pieces and that's because the rest of it is cartilage. Enochondrial bones. Uh, what will occur is, is as the bones grow to the appropriate length they will do something called intermembranous ossification which means they'll become more rigid and more ma mature. Endochondrial ossification, the replacement of cartilage by bone and there are five general steps in the growth in growth and ossification. Starts in the chondriocytes and they begin to calcify. 
Uh, bone forms at the shaft surface. Blood vessels invade the perichondrium, which is the outer version of the chondrocyte. Uh, blood vessels invade the inner region of the cartilage center of the shaft, become the primary center for ossification or bone formation. Bone enlarges. Osteoclasts break down some spongy bone and create a marrow cavity. Epiphyseal cartilages continue to enlarge and increase the length of the bone. Centers of the epiphysis begin to calcify, and that's at the very last, so step five here. The whenever the epiphyseal plate calcifies, we are almost an adult at that point. This would be late teens, early twenties in most individuals. So epiphyseal cartilages between the epiphysis and the dia diaphysis of lung bones, growth at the cartilage is responsible for continuing growth of the bone. When growth ceases, the cartilage disappears, called also growth plates or feces. Uh, apositional growth, bone elongates and increases in diameter. And that's what occurs whenever, and when you're two years old, your femur is not as large as it is whenever you're 19 years old. So as you continue to grow and as you continue to age, the bones become not only longer, but, the, but they become larger in diameter as well. And this is kind of how this occurs. This is endochondrial ossification. Step one here. Um, this is where you're going to start to make the spongy bone. So I'm going to read this here to you. Chondrocytes at the center of the growth cartilage model enlarge and then die uh, as the matrix calcifies. And this is enlarging chondrocytes within a calcifying matrix. Or this, we're talking about this right here. Uh, step two, new derived osteoblasts cover the shaft of the cartilage in a thin layer of bone. And this is where we see the formation of the diaphysis or the shaft and the epiphysis. And we're going to have a proximal and distal end. Uh, blood vessel penetrates the cartilage. New osteoblasts form a primary ossification center. And that's what this is going to be or the development of bone center. We're going to have blood vessels that will permeate into there. Marrow cavity, we still have the diaphysis and the epiphysis here. Bone marrow cavity becomes larger in step four. The bone and the shaft thickens and the cartilage near each epiphysis is replaced by shafts of bone. And this is going to increase, elongate, and become wider and thicker. Uh, blood vessels invade the epiphysis and osteoblasts form secondary centers of ossification. And that would be these areas here. So we're going to start growing at the ends where the articulations are, as well as the center. Um, and this is figure 611 in your book, apositional bone growth. And this is an infant here. This is a child, and as you see, it's becoming thicker. And as an adult, it is pretty thick. It's at least double the size as it was as an infant, if not more. Most bones grow more than this, especially in length. Uh, 2.6, growth and body proportions. The timing of epiphyseal closures varies from bone to bone and individual to individual. Ossification of the toes may be complete by age 11, whereas portions of the pelvis or the wrist may continue to enlarge until age 25. The epiphyseal cartilages in the arms and legs usually close by about age 18 in women and about 20 in men. Requirements for normal bone growth. We require vitamin D. Uh, that's why we will tell people you should drink milk, especially when you're growing. A good, healthy intake of milk helps with calcium and it is vitamin D and fortified. Um, important role in the calcium metabolism attained by vitamins or UV conversion to the skin after conversion in the liver and processing the kidneys produce a derivative called calciotrol and this is what actually controls our calcium levels in our body, calciotrol. Um, vitamin C, scurvy, is a disease resulting from a deficiency of vitamin C which is required for the synthesis, synthesis of collagen in humans. Collagen is the main component in connective tissue. So we're going to see variations of bone growth and shapes of bones if someone has scurvy. And this is why they become bow-legged. Um, 2.8, bone remodeling and homeostatic mechanism. Remodeling, approximately 18% of the protein and mineral components are removed and replaced each year. Spongy bone at the head of the femur 
may be replaced two to three times a year, whereas compact bone may remain the actual may remain the same. So the spongy bone gets remodeled quite often. The compact bone or the hard bone doesn't get remodeled as much unless we actually have a fracture in it. Homeostasis and mineral storage. We require other hormones to actually control our calcium. One of those hormones is from the parathyroid gland, and it is called parathyroid hormone. Upon the release of parathyroid hormone, the bones make more calcium available. So they kind of dissolve themselves and make the calcium that they've stored more available for the rest of the body. And calcitonin lowers blood calcium levels. So what calcitonin is going to do is whenever it is exposed in the body, is it will store the calcium again instead of allowing it to be liberated in the bloodstream. 2.10, injury and repair. A fracture, every crack and break of the bone is the definition of a fracture. A fracture hematoma is a large blood clot formed soon after a fracture occurs. This closes off the injured blood vessels, external calculus, callus, my apologies, external callus is the formation of an area where the bone can be repaired and an internal callus. Internal callus is the formation internally of an area where the bone can be can heal or be repaired. And I'm going to talk you through kind of a fracture here. So in step one here we fractured a bone in this area here. And we have something that forms called a fractured hematoma. Uh, immediately after the fracture extensive bleeding occurs over a period of several hours a large blood clot or fractured hematoma develops. Now after this we're going to go to step two here. An internal callus forms as a network of spongy bone unites the inner edges with an external callus of cartilage and bone stabilizes the outer edges. Spongy bone of the internal callus and then cartilage of the external callus. And this is all new bone growth that's occurring in there, ossification is occurring. And the periosteum is going to attempt to cover it if it can. The cartilage of the external callus has been replaced by the bone and struts of spongy bone now unite the broken ends. Fragments of dead bone and the areas of the bone closest to the break have been removed and replaced. So in this internal and external callus it kind of builds from both ends and eventually what we'll see is in just an external callus. <clears throat> this is in step four. A swollen initially marks the location over the fracture. Over time this region will be remodeled and little evidence of the fracture will remain. Now the longer time that you've had between a fracture there's a good chance that this may be remodeled to its the form that it once was before the actual fracture. Or it could have a bump in it for the rest of its life. It just depends on how the body reutilizes that and figures out if it needs to remodel it or not. Uh, clinical notes, skeletal injuries. We have sprains, which are pretty much injury that stretches or tears one or more ligaments within a joint. And that's what actually holds the bones together. And then we have subluxion, dislocations, and we'll talk about these. These are, these are bad things. Uh, subluxion can actually occur from your sp the spinal column as well. So let's start with sprains. Um, this is an injury to the ligament. A grade 1, minor or incomplete tear. So you didn't tear it all the way. A grade 2 sprain. Significant but incomplete tear. That means you've torn about three quarters of it, give or take. <laughs> a grade three complete tear or total failure. So every time that you try to put weight on this thing, it gives because there's no ligament holding that structure in place. Subluxation, partial dislocation, partial displacement of a bone in from its position within a joint capsule. Um, dislocation, complete displacement of a bone in from the normal position within a joint. And this is a grade 2 ankle sprain, which is, is pretty significant, but all of it didn't come off. It ain't 100% complete failure, but a good portion. Uh, clinical note dislocations, uh, and this is another definition, please be aware of all these. A disruption or displacement of a joint due to trauma is a dislocation. And this is an anterior dislocation of a knee. As you can tell in this area here, things do not look right in that joint. And this thing is popped out to the anterior portion 
or it's popped out in this direction. I believe I got an x ray of this too. There it is. This is patella, lower knee, and it has moved in that direction. Uh, clinical note skeletal injuries. Uh, we have growth plate injuries, which would be bad. Most of the time, whenever a child gets a growth plate injury, they'll actually surgically pin it. Uh, Salter Harris type fracture, type 1, and we got multiple types of the Salter Harris. And Salter Harris are growth plate fractures in general. And I'll read these to you and then we'll look at the actual slides, uh, the pictures to follow. Salter Harris type 1, fracture line runs through the feces. Uh, a type 2, the entire epiphysis and a portion of the metaphysis are broken off. A type 3, a portion of the epiphysis is broken off. Fracture runs through the feces into the epiphysis. And these are a lot easier to look at the pictures. A type 4, a portion of the epiphysis and a portion of the metaphysis are broken off. And a type 5, epiphyseal plate is compressed usually through axial loading. And this means like if we hit the top and bottom together and we kind of jammed it in there. So this is the metaphysis here. The thesis is the actual growth plate or epiphyseal plate. And then you have the epiphysis. So whenever you're talking about this, this is going to be on the bone shaft, the metaphysis. The epiphysis is going to be where all the growth is going to occur at. Or the thesis, epiphyseal plate. And then the epiphysis is going to be the upper portion that is in the articulation or in the joint. And these are the variations of a Salter-Harris fracture. These here would be more worrisome. This one, this one, and possibly this one. This one here can easily be pinned. This one also can easily be pinned. These here, three and four, may actually cause damage to the epiphyseal plate or the growth plate. Please look over those. Salter Harris fractures one through five. Clinical notice for skeletal injuries, types of fractures. We have open fracture, which is open to the external environment. Closed fracture, which is the skin is not broken. Is the main thing on that. You have a green stick, which is generally occurs in the younger folk. Um, the green stick break itself, actually, the bone is not rigid enough to break. So it stresses to the point to where it almost breaks and has lost some of its continuity and essentially gives you a fracture hematoma, but doesn't completely cause a clean break. Uh, a torus localized buckling or swelling of the cortex, uh, transverse, perpendicular to the long axis of the bone, oblique fracture, the fracture extends obliquely to the long axis of the bone, a spiral fracture, torsion fracture occurring when a twisting force is applied to the bone, and this, this will generally make a crack-like effect in a circular fashion around the bone, uh, commuted, which fractures with multiple bone fractures, Segmental, multiple fractures along the axis of a bone. Impacted, uh, fractures that drive the bone ends or fractured ends together. And open versus closed, and very simply, an open fracture is open to the environment. A commuted, this is like 52 piece pickup. An impacted, Load pressure occurred here and here and jammed this area together. A green stick break. We've had an abrasion. This bone probably bent over to that angle and we've lost continuity right here. And I'm going to go ahead and erase this so you can see this a little bit. Uh, and then we have an oblique spiral, which this is in a circular fashion, transverse, which means pretty much clean. It is 
clean and has moved out of alignment a little bit. A torus, which is kind of like a green stick. This this area here, here and here have been stressed. Segmental, which means you have a couple different fractures on a couple different angles. Some of these would have to be surgically. This one here, traction with surgical pinning, surgical pinning, maybe surgical pinning depending on the severity of the spiral fracture. This one, if it was in the right spot, could just be put in a cast. The green stick, keep off of it and let the bone heal. Impacted, probably going to have to apply some traction to get that apart and then pin it. And then this one here, this one may require pins and plates, which is a commuted. Uh, specific fractures, upper extremity fractures, uh, common falls on an outstanding arm. Uh, kids that roller skate, or kids that are on skateboards do this a bunch. They get to go in, they have a high mechanism of, of or a high speed, and will come off of the actual skateboard on an outstretched hand. Well, generally speaking, that will pretty much break their hand. Um, usually occur, a collis fracture usually occurs from an outstretched arm. A supracondyl fracture, fracture of the distal humerus, or just above the elbow, and wherever the weakest point is in the bone is where it's going to break, or wherever the most stress is applied. Um, hip fractures, classification of intracapsular or extracapsular or intra Blood vessel are usually compromised. Hip fractures increase with age. Chances double every decade past 50. Most require surgical intervention. And then we have facial fractures as well, which are Lefort fractures. Uh, a Lefort one fracture to the maxilla at the level of the nares. So this is the nose area. A Lefort two triangular fracture extend, extends line. And this line extends across the ridge of the cheeks and into the orbits. A Lefort three, which is a, f a facial skeleton, is separated from the skull. Entire face lifts off to include both orbits. Uh, shifts with palpation and gentle mobilization. And a Lefort four, facial fracture similar to a Lefort three, but the fracture lines extend upward into the frontal bones. Now these are these are pretty extreme, and we'll see some pictures of them here in a second. Okay, so intercapsular is the ones on the top, and the capsule is this. So this is a capital fracture, and it's kind of uncommon to where we just break that section. Uh, subcapital, which is just be underneath it, trans or mid cervical, and those are kind of rare. So that's right, Johnny, in the middle. Uh, basic cervical. This one here is kind of uncommon, too, because as you get closer to this head, the bone becomes more rigid and has more strength. And these are extracapsulars, which is going to be outside of that area. Intertrochanteric, which is this. This is means in the trochanter area, right in the middle of it, I busted it. And then under, or subtrochanteric, is going to be right underneath it. And these are different types of hip fractures. These are Lefort fractures. This right here, if you break off the top just above your teeth, this is a Lefort 1. A Lefort 2 gives you a triangular representation in the nares. A Lefort 3 is deeper. But this entire section of your upper face will lift off. A person could go into airway compromise pretty easy with Lefort fractures. There is no nasal intubations. Um, the reason is, is sometimes you will the Leforts will give the patient a basilary skull. So as you enter into the nair, you could coil something up in their brain very easily. So keep out of the narrow on anybody that would have a Lefort fracture. Uh, clinical notes, skeletal injuries, fracture healing, heals in three phases. One's the inflammatory phase. Inside the inflammatory response, the granulation tissue able to build cartilage, collagen, and bone. And this, this is what brings all the cells there and say, hey, let's repair this. We have two, which is reparative. 
bone callus forms and external callus becomes hard. And this is where we saw in the other one to where we had an internal and an external callus and they kind of started working together. And then in the third step, and then this is after the bone is already healed where you can walk on it again, uh, which is remodeling. And this is going to trim down the excess parts of the callus are removed. And so that little nodule that you saw in that one picture before to where the bone itself had made the area a little larger. This is all remodeled and trimmed back down to where it was originally. So week one, hematoma and inflammation occur. Week two, soft callus forms. Week four to 16, hard callus forms. We have an internal and an external callus. And then the remodeling, week 17 and beyond, is how much of a bulb do we have that we need to trim off to make this thing look like it did before. Aging in the skeletal system. Osteopenna, inadequate ossification. All people are osteo, osteoporosis, osteopenic as we age. Uh, reduces between 30 and 40. Uh, ages 30 and 40. So your chances after that go up. Uh, clinical note on osteoporosis, reduction of bone mass, ages greater than 45, 29% of these are women and about 18% are men. And sex hormones play a critical role. The ability for you to have strong bones is based on your sex hormones, whether that be estrogen or testosterone. So just something to be aware of there. Clinical note, rheumatism and arthritis. Now, rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis are, are different, even though they're both, they both are inflammation of the joints. Rheumatism, general term describing pain and stiffness that arises in the skeletal or muscle systems or both. Osteoarthritis, degenerative arthritis or degenerative joint disease, usually affects individuals 60 or older. Now, RA, a rheumatoid arthritis, is an autoimmune disease. So this guy on the top here, this is your immune system that essentially has attacked your bones. So if you know somebody with a diagnosis of RA or rheumatoid arthritis, their immune system has essentially attacked themselves. And this is the end of part one of the skeletal system. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. My name is Roy Smith. 219-7613, area code 405, 219-7613, or you can email me at smithr at imsa.net.